About 20 years ago, I wrote my first instructional advanced directive, and I'm glad to say it's been lost. But around the time, I, I discussed it with my, with my children, who are then two girls in their teen years, and said effectively, when my time comes, I'd like to go with dignity. And quick as a flash, they came back. That would make an interesting contrast to the way you've lived. <laughs> let, let me start with a story. And I won't draw out any meaning from this story. I'll leave, it, I'll leave it to Alistair to see if he can, and maybe to you as well. About 15 years ago, um, before the Health Representation Act and the other acts that we've heard about just a few moments ago, a man in his late 80s was referred to me, not as a clinical consultation, he was the relative of a woman, also in her in late 80s, who was going to be transferred from a nursing home to a chronic hospital. And this man um, was cognitively quite intact. He had quite severe visual impairment. And he brought with him uh, her living will. Uh, he had one almost identical. It had been typed up on an old Smith Corona with multiple alterations, but it was signed. It had two components. One was an instructional advance directive, which spoke to her present situation. She had moderately to severely advanced dementia. And it essentially said, no transfer to hospital, no intravenous, no anesthesia, no surgery, no antibiotics. And the second component was a nomination of a substitute decision maker. And I nominate my husband as my substitute decision maker. Now this gentleman uh, came with the belief that not only were um, advanced directives of this type legally enforceable before the law in British Columbia, but that he threatened to sue anyone who touched his wife without his permission would not only th sue the doctors, the nurses, and the long-term care facility to which he was going to be transferred. And this was a considerable risk issue for the facility, and so I was asked to try to talk to them, this man about it. And we, we talked for about an hour or so. In the course of the discussion, it transpired that she had been in a nursing home, had fallen late in the evening, um, had, this was some time before, and uh, a doctor had been called. It was not the doctor on call. The advance directive had been read to the doctor. The doctor said, well, give us a medication for pain, and, uh, and that was it. Next morning, the husband came in where he ordered her transfer to hospital, intravenous, anesthetic, surgery for a broken hip, and antibiotics that you needed in the post-operative period. And uh, we, we had some discussion around this at the time, and it, it seemed that at that point we had which trumps which, clear advance directives or the nomination of a health representative. And in fact, in retrospect, he did what was clinically appropriate, and that the advance directive had not anticipated the situation in which her care was actually improved and her comfort was improved by having surgery for which she had proscribed in her living will. So I, I leave Alistair to sort of draw out further comments on that. In contrast to the patients that we heard about this morning, primarily cognitively intact individuals with severe chronic illness, usually an advancing neurodegenerative condition or cancer, or the circumstance of persistent vegetative state, comatose patients, most deaths are of people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. Those are the deaths I see. And one of the characteristics, or the, the characteristic or the constellation of problems that occur in the pre-death period for those people include age-related decline in their physiological reserve, multiple comorbid chronic conditions, acute illness, and most importantly, altered cognitive function usually an underlying progressive cognitive impairment, very often with delirium superimposed in their last illness and at the end of death. And I have to tell you that the trajectory of dying in old age is very different than the trajectory of dying in people who are younger and have multiple, and have a single neurological disease. It's not only less predictable, and some people recover from dying. One sees individuals who've been placed on palliative management and then something changes and they actually live to die another day. And so it, it's less predictable. And we heard earlier about predict predictions. We're not only poor predictors of times of, of when people might survive, 
but we're also poor predictors of people's quality of life. And I think that's an important thing for us when we're making judgments on behalf of other people. So let me say just a little bit about end-of-life issues in British Columbia. Currently, what Charmaine didn't mention is that we've had for a long time in British Columbia a form that can be signed by a physician to, for a person living in the community or going into a facility or a hospital um, that removes the responsibility for paramedics when called doing CPR. Because otherwise, paramedics are required to perform CPR on people for whom they're called. And so a form signed by the physician and kept by the person uh, will obviate that occurring. In the mid-1980s, uh, a joint committee, the BCMA and the Ministry of Health, uh, did some work on some, some guidelines for death and dying in long-term care facilities. And by the late 1980s, most long-term care facilities had things called degrees of intervention. They were not advanced directives for the most part signed by patients, but they were advanced orders written by the physician based upon their discussion with the individual, their family, and a whole lot of clinical considerations. And essentially, they range from transfer to hospital through to compassionate terminal care, levels one, two, three, and four. Then came the, then came the health representation agreement. And the issue of many people going into long-term care facilities without any advanced planning document. And to create a health representation agreement, a person has to be capable. And yet the reality is most people going into long-term care facilities and many of those being transferred to hospital have degrees of cognitive impairment that preclude them from uh, creating an, an advanced planning document of that type. So let me say just a little bit about some of the our work or our thinking about some of the indicators of quality of health care at the end of life. And the reference was made to the BCMA goals and principles for care of older persons in BC, which subsequently became the CMA policy. And it, it deals with a whole range, I won't read them all out, but a range of ethical and legal issues that speak to facilitating individuals discussing advanced planning wishes and also empowering them and also following those advanced directives. And I, if anyone is interested in this, uh, check the CMA website. It's actually been it's disappeared from the BCMA website, but I've asked them to put it back on again. And just look for goals and principles of care for older people. And that would save me a few minutes and uh, be able to proceed to something else. Um, let me talk a little bit about this physician assistance in end-of-life issues, and whether we call it suicide or physician assistance in dying. I think the point, uh, we heard that earlier. Hippocratic tradition prohibits, quotes, administering deadly medicine if asked or counseling the same. However, having said that, we know of physicians that have been involved not only in um, assisting individuals to die, but actually causing their death. The most recent cases are the Shipman case in, in Britain. Perhaps the most celebrated case is not Jack Kevorkian, but Lord Dawson of Penn, who was a founding member of the British Euthanasia Society in 1935 and happened to be King George V's personal physician. And many of you will know the story, but in fact he was euthanized. And the timing of his death uh, was uh, was timed in order that the death notice would go into the Times of London the next morning and not into the inferior afternoon papers. Um, again, uh, I can give you details of that later if you, if you wish. Uh, I, I'm not an official spokesperson either for the BCMA or the CMA, but I can point you to the CMA's position on euthanasia and assisted suicide, which uh, again is on the CMA website. Canadian physicians should not participate in euthanasia or assisted suicide, and uh, there is a much longer discussion around this and some recommendations about any future uh, legislative change. Uh, reference was made to two bills in Britain, one in the Scottish Parliament, the Death with Dignity Act, and a second one in the English Parliament, uh, assisted dying for the terminally ill, uh, the position of the British Geriatric Society uh, in Britain is that uh, prohibition against intentional killing is an important cornerstone of our society and 
it unquestionably denies the right of a very, very small proportion of the population to have their life ended, but goes on to say that these are important restrictions on individual liberty in, our, in a society. Let me, again, we heard a little bit about Oregon. Um, the report of this year's report of the last seven years' experience uh, speaks to around 200 people in the last seven years who have, um, who have taken advantage of that. Uh, some, something like 60 people in the last year had their prescription filled and 40, uh, sorry, had the prescription given and 40 filled and used their prescriptions. The drugs they're using are, are pentabarb and secabarb. Uh, there are instances in this report, which is available on the web, uh, of individuals surviving 31 hours after having taken the drug and of, of not necessarily good deaths. Individuals who have vomited and uh, developed respiratory complications after taking the drugs. So let me summarize in the remaining 38 seconds. Um, <laughs> I can conceive of situations where rational suicide to achieve a good or heroic death might be in an individual's interest, and they may think this is an appropriate thing to do. At a practical level, I'm concerned about, I, I spend a lot of time dealing with encouraging people to set up advanced directives to discuss these issues in advance, and I'm involved to, to one degree or another with at least a death every week. I'm also dealing very often with conflict between family members who have different views as to whether this is terminal and what is heroic and what are the kinds of options. And sometimes trying to interpret those kinds of issues when, even when there is an advanced directive that family members may, may feel uh, they have a right at a time of severe illness to uh, exercise some influence on these kinds of decisions that are being made. And the primary one is transfer to hospital from long-term care facilities where we know a series of things will happen that may not necessarily be in the person's interest. The two difficult things I do in medicine, one is advise people that they should stop driving, and the second is deal with family conflict over decision-making at the end of life. Finally, I I'm quite concerned about the imposition of a burden on physicians to be the individuals to assist with dying. Uh, why not pharmacists? Uh, why not nurse practitioners? Why not psychologists or social workers? Uh, this so fundamentally dealing with end of life symptoms is part of us. Intentionally killing people is not part of most physicians' uh, view of how things should be. Uh, when Physicians have been polled, about 50% think that this may be allowed in some circumstances. But when physicians are asked, would you participate, it's something like a 75 or 25 split. That's from the UK. I don't know any comparable Canadian figures. So with that, I'll close and hear from Alistair. Thank you.